it wasn't working for a moment. Okay, consciousness is often said to be highly mysterious, perhaps more so than anything else. The apparent mystery, I think it is only an apparent mystery, is often suggested by Thomas Nagel's evocative phrase, what it's like, which Nagel uses to capture the subjective nature of consciousness. According to Nagel, that subjective nature prevents us from explaining consciousness in objective terms, blocking any physicalist or functionalist account, but also anything else informative that one might want to say about consciousness. One result of Nagel's highly influential work, and I should say um, um, I disagree very strongly with what Nagel says about consciousness, but uh, his work is really of the highest quality in my view. Uh, I'm a big admirer of the work, even though I disagree. Uh, one result of that work is that many people have largely set aside explaining what consciousness itself is, what it is for a mental state to be conscious, and have come instead just to look for some neural correlate of consciousness. Sorry, my, there we go. Um, the global workspace theory uh, and integrated information theory um, are two examples of looking for a neural correlate of consciousness, and neither of them uh, directly addresses what consciousness is, what it consists in. Having a neural correlate of consciousness will indeed be very useful whenever we actually finally get one, but determining how consciousness is neurally implemented is going to require a correct account of what consciousness is, a correct account of what the mental phenomenon is whose neural implementation we want to find. Indeed, the proliferation of incompatible theories with little convergence among them may in part be due to addressing implementation without first being clear about what it is that we're trying to implement. Nagel's own account of consciousness is wholly unhelpful, I think. He explains consciousness in terms of what it's like. He explains what it's like in terms of subjectivity. He explains that in terms of points of view. And then he circles back to what it's like. Uh, and this treatment, in a way, echoes uh, Quine's closed curve of terms uh, that Quine says one is stuck with if one tries to explain analyticity. We won't understand what consciousness is from such cognate terms, because those cognate terms are in effect just alternate descriptions of consciousness. We're just saying the same thing over and over again. To be usable, an account of what it is for a mental state to be conscious cannot be circular. It cannot appeal to consciousness itself. We need an account that's cast in terms of phenomena that are not themselves conscious. Still, since consciousness is a psychological phenomenon, no account can capture that psychological nature unless it appeals to phenomena that are mental. Though, again, to, to avoid circularity, they have to be mental but not conscious. And that's the strategy that higher order theories generally adopt. We explain what it is for a mental state to be conscious by appeal to mental phenomena but mental phenomena that are not themselves conscious. To do this, high order theories appeal to a common sense folk observation about consciousness, specifically about how conscious mental states differ from mental states that are not conscious. If one is in some mental state, for example, suppose one thinks something or perceives something, desires something, whatever, but one is wholly unaware of doing so, then that mental state is not a conscious state. And this folk theoretic platitude also governs most experimental investigation. And I think that this folk theoretic platitude uh, is widely accepted uh, in the first place, and in the second place is kind of an opening wedge for uh, what a successful theory of consciousness will be. The folk theoretic platitude as I've formulated, it, namely if one is in some state that one is wholly unaware of, then uh, that state is not a conscious state. That's a sufficient condition for a mental state not to be conscious. 
But as such, that sufficient condition for a state not to be conscious is equivalent to a necessary condition for a mental state to be conscious. And that necessary condition is that one be in some way aware of the state. I've called this latter the transitivity principle, and it's endorsed in some form or other by every higher order theory of consciousness. A mental state is conscious only if there is an, some higher order awareness of that state. Being aware of a state is necessary for a state to be conscious, but of course it's not sufficient. I might be aware that I want something because you tell me that I do. You figured out that I wanted it uh, on the basis of my behavior or whatever it is. Uh, my desire is not a conscious state, but I believe you. I take your word for it that I want it. Uh, and in this case, uh, uh, I'll be aware of the state because you told me about it, uh, but it won't be a conscious state. So we have to say a bit more, and we can close in on a sufficient condition if we determine what way of being aware of a state figures in its being conscious. And one constraint is the one that's elicited from uh, the example that I just uh, considered, namely that the awareness must not, as the foregoing example does, rely on conscious inference. More generally, the awareness must not seem to be such that anything mediates between the awareness and the target of the awareness. Even if something actually does mediate, perhaps there is some inference that leads from the state that I'm aware of to my awareness, it must not seem to me that there is any mediation. If there is any mediation, I must be unaware of it. Also, a higher order awareness will not itself be conscious unless there's a third order awareness of that higher order awareness. And that's of course very rare. And this avoids circularity since the higher order awareness is not generally itself conscious, we get to explain a state's being conscious by appeal to a mental phenomenon that is not itself conscious. I'll say a bit more about the nature of these higher order awarenesses in section two, but first I wanna say a few words about critics of higher order theories. First order theories reject the transitivity principle uh, and so they deny any role for higher order awarenesses um, um, uh, uh, in consciousness. And denying that is what makes, that's what it is for a theory to be a first order theory. Um, uh, I have global workspace theory in parentheses with a question mark here. Um, many people would think global workspace theory is a first order theory because indeed it does uh, often seem to deny any role for higher order awarenesses. There's a little bit of question about whether global workspace theory actually does deny that. This, this might be an area of a little bit of uh, convergence uh, between theories. Uh, between global workspace theory and higher order theory. But global workspace theory concentrates on neural implementation, right? So global workspace theory is not in the business of saying what it is for a mental state to be a conscious state. And the first order theories that I'm going to be talking about are all in, or at least ostensibly, in that business. They're in the business of saying what it is uh, for a mental state to be a conscious state. And since they deny that what it is for a mental state to be conscious has anything to do with a higher order awareness, they end up saying that being conscious, that a state's being conscious is an intrinsic property of that state, uh, that consciousness is an intrinsic property. Uh, and what I just said a slide or two ago is that according to higher order theories, it will seem that there's no mediation between the state and the higher order awareness. That will seem to be the case, that the, the, the higher order awareness will be subjectively unmediated. But first order theories say not subjectively unmediated, really unmediated. 
there is actually no mediation because the higher the, the awareness if there is any awareness is inside the state itself but as we saw with nagel uh seeing consciousness as intrinsic to the state deprives first order theorists from anything informative to say about what it is for a mental state to be conscious. And Ned Block, uh, who was probably these days uh, really the foremost first order theorist, acknowledges as much uh, very explicitly. Uh, uh, a quotation from some years ago, uh, Block thinks that we can say little if anything about what conscious qualitative character consists in beyond Louis Armstrong's famous quip about jazz, if you got to ask, you ain't never going to get to know. Uh, but more recently, he has uh, brought this into the present without being so catchy by writing that the best you can do is to use words to point to a phenomenon that the reader has to experience from the first person point of view. This is the best you can do in talking about conscious states. Uh, I don't have any idea what Bloch means by pointing here. Uh, I don't know how if you pointed to a phenomenon, whatever that might mean, how I would know whether you were pointing to what I experienced from a first person point of view. Uh, so it seems to me basically Bloch is saying you can't say anything informative at all about what it is for a mental state to be conscious. Denying the transitivity principle is actually taking a position on what it is for a mental state to be conscious, or, albeit it's a negative position. It's saying it's not this. Uh, so the result is uh, that first order theorists have really nothing informative to say about what it is for a mental state to be conscious. Uh, except, of course, implying that somehow or another it's an intrinsic property. And if consciousness is intrinsic, then there's nothing mental that one could appeal to in order to theorize about consciousness, except, of course, consciousness itself. So it's being intrinsic to a conscious state would prevent theorizing, and that's what seems to me to create the sense of mystery that people sometimes talk about. So since there is nothing informative to say from a first, per, from a first order point of view uh, um, about uh, what it is for a mental state to be conscious, Bloch turns instead to an account of the neural conditions for being conscious. And Bloch favors Victor Lama's proposal that perceptions are conscious if recurrent processing occurs in the relevant areas of sensory cortex. People usually talk in this context about visual cortex, which is very elaborate, but uh, recurrent processing means that there's uh, feed forward processing uh, in cortex uh, from one area to another, and then there's feedback uh, processing and then feed forward again and so forth. That's what recurrent processing consists in. Uh, and Lama's view is that perceptions are conscious if there is this recurrent processing in the relevant area of sensory cortex, visual cortex, auditory cortex, uh, sensory motor cortex, and so forth. And this would obviate any need for a higher order awareness. We just say uh, what the conditions are for a state's being conscious in neural terms, and then we can get away with sustaining the first order denial of the transitivity principle. But whatever neural implementation one proposes, we're going to have to specify in psychological terms what's being implemented. This was the point that I was making earlier. And first order theories have nothing useful to say there just that one knows it when one sees it. High order theories have proposals as well about neural implementation, typically urging that high order awarenesses occur in prefrontal cortex. And indeed there is increased prefrontal cortex activation when a state is conscious in contrast with such a states occurring unconsciously. 
First order theorists deny that this activation has anything to do with consciousness. They typically urge that it reflects only a disposition on the part of the individual to report the state, which they think is independent of consciousness, or they think it has something to do with some other cognitive occurrence that is not relevant to consciousness because it's an extra thing. It's not consciousness itself. But if high order theories are correct, that a state's being conscious consists in one's being aware of it, then consciousness may indeed involve some higher order cognitive processing. That's at least an open possibility. To deny that without independent argument is simply to beg the question against the higher order view. Still, high order theories are not tied to any particular account of neural implementation. We'll find the right neural implementation in time. The main issue is what it is for a state to be conscious, specified in psychological terms, because being conscious is a psychological phenomenon. Having little to say about that, first order theories go straight to neural implementation, and then they cast high order theories also in neural terms. And this is, uh, this is an interesting aspect of the recent dialectic when people discuss consciousness in this context, uh, that uh, first order theories uh, not only say, well, we can tell you what it is for a mental state to be conscious, and then they do so in neural terms, not in psychological terms. And then they say, and high order theories are the ones that talk about prefrontal cortex. Uh, and higher-order theories actually do talk about prefrontal cortex because it looks as though prefrontal cortex is where higher-order awareness would occur. But that's because, first of all, higher-order theories are talking about a higher-order awareness, right? And then they're looking for what the good neural implementation of that is. And if they're wrong about that neural implication, I think we're probably right about it. But if we were wrong about it, um, that it, it, it wouldn't do anything to refute a high order theory, because a high order theory is cast basically in psychological terms. Um, anyway, yes, that's so I, I've been in effect, going off slide and uh, putting in other words, my next, next bullet point that we should avoid seeing the issue between first order and high order theories in terms of neural implementation. We should rather stick instead with the psychological issue about what it is for a state to be conscious. Otherwise we have no clear testable idea of what phenomenon we're talking about. So uh, turning then to higher order theory um, itself. Um, and I'll begin by still, I'm going to talk for a moment about one other first order theorist who kind of stands on his own in a certain way, because most first order theorists, as I've said, have no usable account of what it is for a mental state to be conscious, simply casting it as, it as an intrinsic property that we know when we see it. But Fred Dretzky is a notable exception. Uh, uh, Fred argues that a state is conscious, not if one is aware of it, which is what high order theorists say, but rather if one's being in that state makes one aware of something else. Uh, so uh, if I see a rabbit, uh, then uh, if I consciously see a rabbit, the reason that my seeing is conscious is because it makes me aware of the rabbit, according to Dretzky. Uh, it's not because I'm aware of the state of seeing, which is what we high order theorists say. And this is an informative claim about what it is for a state to be conscious. This is actually, this is substance. He, Dretzky is talking about the real thing. Uh, and uh, this claim rejects the transitivity principle, so it's a first order theory. Um, but as Dretzky came to re recognize, unconscious perceiving also makes one aware of things, it just doesn't make one consciously aware. So if I uh, 
subliminally see a rabbit. I, I, I see a rabbit, but my seeing is not conscious, right? Uh, my seeing the rabbit unconsciously is going to have all sorts of effects on my psychological processing. And it couldn't have those effects on my psychological processing if it didn't in some way make me aware of the rabbit. What it doesn't do is it doesn't make me consciously aware. And uh, this is actually a distinction that you can see in the popular literature when people are trying to explain in the popular literature what unconscious perception consists in. So unconscious perceiving also makes one aware of things, just not consciously aware. So Dretzky amended his theory to provide that a perception is conscious only if one can cite its content as a justifying reason for doing something, which is a bit of a mouthful. And that rules out unconscious perception. And I think Dretzky is successful in ruling out unconscious perception in that way. But there's a pretty heavy price for Dretzky because citing the content of a perception is then the mark of a perception's being conscious. But note that one can cite something only if one is aware of it. And that's the transitivity principle. So Dretzky saves his first order account with this citing thing up here. Uh, Dretzky saves his first order account only by appealing by implication to exactly what high order theories require in the first place. Dretzky's difficulty lies in accommodating mental states that aren't conscious. That was what created the difficulty. If, if all mental states were conscious, there would be no difficulty. Uh, then he could have his account. Uh, uh, and because he has difficulty in accommodating mental states that aren't conscious, he also has difficulty in explaining how conscious and unconscious mental states differ. And this difficulty, I think, affects all first order theories. Um, if global workspace theory is a first order theory, then that's an exception, but we're gonna put that aside. Uh, if being conscious is intrinsic to conscious states, then no conscious state can also occur unconsciously. If it's intrinsic, then you can't take it away because it's an intrinsic aspect of it. And this is characteristic of all first order theories. And it comes out especially strongly in Bloch's first order concept of phenomenal consciousness, which I'll talk a bit more about in the next uh, section, the next and final section. High order theories have no difficulty in explaining the difference between conscious and unconscious mental states. In fact, the transitivity principle is geared to do exactly that. It explains what it is for a state to be conscious by appeal to the way mental states that are conscious differ from mental states that aren't. Uh, one might seek to combine high order and first order views by holding that a state's being conscious consists in one's being aware of that state, that's high order, but then say that the high order awareness is intrinsic to the state. Uh, there are a very small number of people who say this. But on any independently warranted way of individuating mental states, they are distinct. That is to say, what I'm saying is what you need in order to make this claim, if you say uh, that the high order awareness is intrinsic to the state, then you need to have some way of individuating states. And it's no good to say, well, I individuate states so that this comes out this way. Right, you can't do that. What you've got to do is you've got to start first with an independent way of individuating states and then see whether it does come out this way. And what I'm urging is that on no independently warranted way of individuating, does it come out that way? Also, if being intrinsic means that the high order awareness is essentially tied to the state's other mental properties, then as with pure first order theories, we won't be able to explain how conscious and unconscious mental states differ. 
will be in the same position. We won't have advanced anything. But if the higher order and other mental properties are independent, then we will be able to explain that contrast. But the cost is that the higher order awareness is intrinsic in name only. It's a merely verbal thing. And really all it is is just a higher order theory. As noted, nothing can seem subjectively to mediate between the higher order awareness and the first order state. And because a higher order, sorry, because a third order awareness of a higher order awareness occurs only when we introspect, or at least this is, I think, a good hypothesis. When we introspect, we kind of pay attention to being aware of the state of, um, uh, we pay attention to being aware of uh, the state that's conscious. Uh, so we're not, aware of it in a kind of subliminal way, we become aware of it in a conscious way. So higher order awarenesses are themselves, as I've remarked in the last section, rarely conscious. First order theorists sometimes claim that a higher order account can't make its target state, uh, higher order awareness can't make its target state conscious without being conscious itself. Uh, first order, uh, theorists sometimes think of consciousness as a kind of substance that the higher order awareness must be passing on to the target state, that the target state inherits consciousness from the higher order awareness. But that's not the way the theory is supposed to work. That's just a misconception of the theory. On a higher order theory, a state's being conscious consists in one's being suitably aware of that state. So the objection just begs the question against higher order theories. And an unconscious higher order awareness does make one aware of a first order state, as I've mentioned, just as unconscious perceptions make one aware of stimuli, just not consciously aware of stimuli. Since higher order awarenesses are rarely conscious, they don't occur in routine phenomenology. Higher order awarenesses are theoretical posits justified by explanatory success, not by first person access. If a state is conscious, we can report being in that state. And a report is a reliable indicator of a state's being conscious if that report is independent of any conscious inference. If the report seems unmediated, is subjectively unmediated, then being able to report that I'm in some state is a reliable indicator of the state's being conscious. Now, when I report a state, when I report anything, uh, when I say anything, I express some thought that I have. So if I report that I'm in a state, the content of my report is that I'm in the first order state. That's what I'm saying when I report the state. Since speech acts express thoughts that have the same content, such reports express thoughts about first order states. So if I say, um, I see a rabbit reporting my state of seeing a rabbit, then I'm expressing a thought that I have that I see a rabbit. Thoughts make one aware of their objects. So the tie with reportability suggests that higher order awarenesses are simply higher order thoughts, thoughts that one, ha thoughts one has that one is in a particular type of mental state. Conscious states are of course rarely reported. What matters is not that it is actually reported, but only that it could be. It only, what matters is simply reportability. And a state's being reportable is the ability that one has verbally to express a higher order thought. And so that higher order thought must occur in order to be expressible. Um, infants and non-linguistic animals, that's what some people who are suspicious about higher order thoughts uh, point to. Um, and of course, they can't express thoughts verbally. Uh, 
uh, but I think doubtless infants and non-linguistic animals have many thoughts and it's not unreasonable then to th expect that they have some high order thoughts, maybe not very many uh, and maybe uh, rather simple in content, but being simple in content is okay because high order thoughts need not be demanding conceptually or epistemically. And the high order thoughts of infants and non-linguistic animals will be very simple. High order thoughts need not involve metalistic concepts. They describe first order states simply in a minimal way, just enough to distinguish a first order state from other first order states that are rather similar. There are other reasons to favor higher order thoughts, though I think reportability, the reportability consideration is uh, perhaps uh, uh, the strongest. Uh, um, a state can be conscious in respect of some, but not all of its mental properties. And this is probably so for most conscious states, I say here, uh, I think maybe almost all conscious states. It's a very rare conscious state that would be conscious in respect of all of its mental properties. And high order thoughts readily explain that since a state will be conscious on the high order thought view in respect of whatever descriptive content the high order thought has. So it can be more detailed or less detailed and one's consciousness of the state will be more or less detailed uh, uh, in accordance with that. Also, there aren't really all that many options for what kind of awareness there could be uh, that figures in higher order awarenesses. Higher order sensing and perceiving won't work, I think, because there are no higher order mental qualities, and that leaves only higher order thoughts, or at least that's, um, well, I think it does actually leave only higher order thoughts. There are people who say, well, direct acquaintance. Um, but the people who say direct acquaintance don't tell us what direct acquaintance is. They just say it's there and very important. And with no clear account of what direct acquaintance does consist in, uh, appealing to it, I think, is just unhelpful stipulation. Um, then there's a very tricky argument for the high order thought view which I'm going to skip because it's a little complicated, but if anybody is interested, we can come back to it in discussion. Hakuan Lau has urged that the high order state must have, quoting him, the content that a particular first order perceptual representation is a reliable reflection of the external world right now. A reliable reflection of the external world right now. Uh, but unconscious perceptions can also elicit confidence. What Lau is really appealing to is the idea that um, uh, there, there, there is a measure of confidence in the way the higher order uh, state represents the first order uh, perceptual representation. Uh, so there is experimental work uh, that unconscious perceptions elicit confidence. Uh, but um, you all know about blind sight. Blind sight is where either surgically or by accident, um, uh, the primary uh, visual cortex uh, is destroyed. And uh, there is this blind sight monkey, Helen, uh, who is very interesting. And we can, again, I have uh, two pictures of her because I have two videos which we could look at later if you're interested. Uh, but Helen uh, uh, got to be extremely good with her blind sight. And, uh, sorry, th th this was a surgical thing uh, that um, uh, for experimental purposes, uh, her primary visual cortex was removed. Uh, and uh, she got to be able to, the thing that is most exciting, and I can't find video for this, but I, I have in the past seen video, is she could catch flies in midair. And if you can catch a fly in midair, then you're better than me, but you're not better than Helen. And one thing about that is you have to have confidence that the fly is there. 
right? So there is a measure of perceptual confidence that's very strong uh, with the kinds of things Helen could do. Uh, another thing that I, the video does show this is uh, uh, throwing little currants, uh, little tiny fruits, uh, just this tiny fruits uh, into the area that Helen was at and she'd just grab at them, grab at them, grab at them. And, you know, she'd never miss, right? Uh, so this is perceptual confidence and it's unconscious. Uh, there's every reason to think that the way her brain works and the way our brain works, if there's no uh, primary visual cortex, it's not conscious. Also, if awareness of first, of first order state is sufficient for consciousness, as I've been arguing, then reliability is redundant. So this uh, reliability that Lau is arguing for is from my point of view an extra. And indeed in the paper that I'm quoting from, uh, which is not published, but it is online, uh, Lau notes that perceptions that are judged unreliable can be conscious, not as perceptual states, but as imagery. They're just not conscious in the normal way, he says. So being judged reliable apparently doesn't matter to whether a state is conscious, only to how it's conscious. When there is something it's like for one to be in some mental state, for example, to see or hear something, one is subjectively aware of oneself as being in that state. The content of a higher order thought makes one aware of oneself in just that way, as being in a state with the relevant mental properties. So higher order content determines phenomenology. It determines what it's like for one. There being something is like for one just is subjectively taking oneself to be in some target state. And although I have argued and continue to think that higher order awarenesses are actually higher order thoughts, generic higher order awarenesses do very well for many theoretical purposes. And I'll often simply speak of them instead of higher order uh, awarenesses. Now my third section, and if I have, looking at my clock uh, here, um, I might go over an hour a little bit uh, with this section. I hope that that's okay. Uh, and then I'll be happy to stay as long as you want for questions. Uh, high order theories posit two independent mental factors. One is a higher order awareness, which varies with whether a state is conscious. And the other factor is a state's other mental properties. Because primary, because prefrontal uh, cortex is uh, distinct from perceptual cortex, if prefrontal activation varies with whether a perception is conscious, that's indirect evidence for those two independent mental factors. First order theories, by contrast, see the property of a state's being conscious as intrinsic to the state. So there's only one mental factor. So first order theorists seek to undermine any tie of uh, PFC activation with consciousness. But PFC activation is at best only indirect evidence for independent mental factors. So let's for now set aside the neural and focus directly on the psychological. We can then look for direct psychological evidence that there are independent mental factors, one varying with consciousness and the other with the state's other mental properties. Such independence could be, could consist in two different things. It could be uh, that one of those factors occurs without the other. Either consciousness occurs without the other mental properties or the mental properties occur without consciousness. Or it could be uh, that subjective awareness and the other mental properties occur, but there's a mismatch between them. That subjective awareness has content that fails to match the independent mental reality. And we'll talk about both kinds of thing. On Bloch's widely accepted concept of phenomenal consciousness, consciousness is an aspect of qualitative mental character. 
So on that concept, there can't be two independent factors. If phenomenal consciousness is an aspect of mental qualities, mental qualities can't occur without being conscious, and they also can't vary independently of the way in which they're conscious. Bloch's concept construes qualitative mental qualities in a first-order way, exclusively in terms of first-person access to qualitative states. But that concept is wholly optional. We can conceive of qualitative mentality altogether independently of consciousness. Since first-person access is only to what is conscious, a first-person concept of mental qualities implies that they are always conscious. But there's another way to get at qualitative states, qualitative mental states. Qualitative states also play distinctive roles in perceiving by enabling us to discriminate perceptually among different types of stimuli. So instead of appealing to first person awareness, we can instead fix each mental quality by the stimulus type that it enables one to discriminate from its perceptible neighbors. And that one liner uh, is basically uh, the summary of what Yaya referred to in introducing me as quality space theory, but I'm not going to uh, elaborate on this very much. I'm just going to give a very minimal uh, statement of uh, this. Uh, so uh, again, uh, we can fix each mental quality by the stimulus type that it enables, that that mental quality enables one to discriminate from other stimulus types. And perception discriminates stimuli both consciously and unconsciously. So if we fix mental qualities by discriminative role, that's going to be independent of whether the states that, are, that have those mental qualities are conscious states. And then higher order awarenesses could make one aware of qualitative states in respect of that discriminative role. Uh, and I have more to say about that, which I could say uh, in discussion if anybody is interested. Since we can fix each mental quality apart from consciousness, qualitative mentality presents no obstacle for the independent mental factors that higher order theories posit. So there's an issue about high order theories. Here's the issue. Since higher order awarenesses are distinct from the first order states that they make one aware of, might it be the case that higher order awarenesses sometimes misrepresent those first order states? That they make us aware of states in a way that is different from the actual mental nature of those states. Uh, some people, I should say actually most first order theorists, but very notably uh, Alex Byrne and Karen Neander and Joe Levine have claimed that consciousness cannot misrepresent. And that if there is a theory that even allows that it might misrepresent, that decisively undermines that theory. Um, this is a slightly peculiar thing because high order theories don't actually say that um, consciousness ever actually does misrepresent. It just leaves open that possibility. So if one held that it can't misrepresent, one could endorse a high order theory and just stipulate in addition that consciousness never misrepresents. So that's just a bit of the dialectic here about the objection. But that aside, the claim that there is any problem about misrepresentation simply channels the way first order theories see things. One wouldn't think that there is a problem about misrepresentation unless one was a first order theorist. And that's because the only reason to think that misrepresentation can't occur would be the first order claim that the property of a state's being conscious is intrinsic to every conscious state. 
And if one thought that that was true, one would then expect that the way we're aware of a conscious state can't diverge from that state's actual mental nature. But if consciousness is not an intrinsic property, then there's no reason remaining to think that it can't misrepresent a conscious state's other mental properties. So whether misrepresentation actually occurs is open. Sorry, I don't know why this occurs. Good. And if consciousness does sometimes misrepresent a conscious state's other mental properties, well, that's very interesting for assessing higher order and first order theories, because then we have psychological evidence that consciousness and those other mental properties are independent. It would show that being conscious is not after all an intrinsic property as first order theories hold, but consciousness occurs independently of a state's other mental properties. And there is in fact very compelling evidence, very strong evidence that consciousness does sometimes misrepresent. A vivid case is change blindness in which a change is perceived, but it isn't consciously perceived. This is something that um, 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 people love to um, fiddle with in lab experiments, but of course it happens all the time in everyday life. Uh, but the interesting thing is that it was discovered 20 years ago or thereabouts that even when subjects report not seeing the changes, we can determine experimentally by priming effects and forced choice guessing that the changes were actually perceived. So uh, priming effects, uh, the, the, the change that, that subjects think wasn't seen actually primes for other results like um, 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 uh, what, what sort of thing you will choose uh, if you're asked to choose it or um, um, uh, various other priming effects. Uh, and uh, for forced choice guessing is where you say to the subject, uh, so just guess whether this thing changed. Uh, and the subject says, well, I just told you, nothing changed. And you say, well, just humor me, just guess. And then what happens is that they guess and they guess right. Uh, something like in, in most of these kinds of case, uh, something in the order of 80% correct. In these cases, consciousness represents that one didn't perceive a change, even though there is evidence that one did perceive the change. So consciousness varies independently of the first order perceptual states. Since first order theorists hold that consciousness is intrinsic, they're tempted to claim that misrepresentation can't occur. And they typically do claim that, but it actually simply does occur. And it constitutes strong evidence against first order theories and the denial that first order theories make of the transitivity principle we have psychologically based evidence that favors higher order theories. Um, a favorite uh, of mine, uh, John Grimes. So um, you all know what saccades are. Saccades are these sort of uh, uh, abrupt movements that the eye makes that are completely outside of our control. And during a saccade, uh, almost no uh, information from the retina goes back to visual cortex, uh, which is nice because the retina is moving abruptly. Uh, uh, so Grimes had this idea that he would change displays during saccades and see uh, whether uh, people would miss changes. Uh, and many subjects miss many changes. And a favorite change for many people, myself included, is a centrally located salient change, which I'll show you in a moment, from green to red, uh, which is very dramatic. So consider, after the saccade, after the change, red input then does get from the retina to visual cortex, the, the, the stimulus change from green to red. So after the saccade, the stimulus is red, red light is reaching the retina and 
uh, that input is going back to visual cortex. So then the visual state that the subject is in is uh, perceiving red. But if the subject takes him or herself not to have noticed any change, then presumably the subjective awareness of that subject may very well remain an awareness of seeing green, what it was before. And that would be a very dramatic disparity between subjective awareness and first order visual state. It's very hard to see how you can square these findings with a first order theory. Here's the green and there's the red. So it's in the middle of nothing is more salient than the parrot uh, in that display. And, you know, uh, uh, most 82% of the subjects got it, but one out of five isn't so bad. <laughs> I mean, one out of five missed it, uh, which is very striking. In another study, consciously discriminable stimuli were degraded, so they were no longer consciously discriminable, but they were still consciously detectable. Nonetheless, forced choice guesses discriminated still well above chance. The mental qualities remained conscious. Nothing, so that's because it was, things were consciously detectable. It was just that they weren't conscious any longer in respect of discriminable differences among the stimuli. Subjects' awareness of the mental qualities became too coarse-grained to enable conscious discrimination. But since subjects could still discriminate, they retain unconscious qualitative aspects of the conscious qualities. Um, um, so this is what happens with this one is, uh, uh, th these were set up so that uh, every two, uh, e every pair of patches were either the same or they were different but they were different below the level where a subject would notice the difference. And that was tested previously. Um, and, uh, but as you go around the circle, which is what subjects were asked to do, wavelengths increased. And what happened was whenever uh, subjects judged two patches to be the same, this central thing appears and they can adjust the central thing to match the two that they judge to be the same. And what they do is, as they go around the circle, they keep on matching uh, in ways that uh, 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 follow the change of wavelengths, even though they think that there's no perceptible change. So that's another case of unconscious aspects of the qualities and a an oldie but goodie, a classic. George Sperling briefly presented subjects with a three by four matrix of letters. After they disappear, subjects can identify only three or four of them. But if a subsequent tone, high tone, middle tone, low tone, uh, cues subjects to a particular row, then subjects get most of the letters in that row. And since the letters are all gone and uh, any row could be cued. Subjects have to have be retaining information about most of the identities. Block urges that they retain this information consciously and that these kinds of findings, that this experiment, but also related experiments, show that phenomenal consciousness overflows cognitive access. But few identities are conscious without cueing. So, it's more reasonable to think that what's going on is that the letters are conscious, but they're not conscious in respect of their specific identity, whether it's an R or an M and so forth. What overflows cognitive access is unconscious information. Unconscious qualitative aspects of conscious perceptions are at work in all these studies, and a state is conscious in respect of some mental aspect only if one is aware of that mental aspect. So this is a refined version of what I've been calling the transitivity principle. Consciousness misrepresents perception by omitting aspects that enable performance. So we know that the perception, we know that those aspects of perception are there because they enable performance. 
And what's omitted is psychological, not subpersonal. I'll say more about that later if you like. Um, and there's another funny thing about the uh, about peripheral vision. Um, outside of a relatively narrow range, so-called uh, foveal vision, um, uh, the retina doesn't uh, sustain very much in the way of color discrimination. Nonetheless, when we look out and we see things, it appears to us as though uh, everything is in vivid colors way out here when it's still conscious. Uh, and in this case, consciousness in effect outstrips the visual states, something that's come to be called subjective inflation. Um, that's another wonderful experiment that I won't go into and some more about Hakuan Lao, which if you're curious, I can say about that later. Uh, <clears throat> on first order theories, the reality of conscious states is just their appearance. Thus, Nagel writes, the idea of moving from appearance to reality seems to make no sense for conscious experiences. If the appearance of conscious states is all there is to their reality, so that mental apparent appearance lacks any ties with anything else, then mental appearance drives out theorizing. We won't be able to theorize because mental appearance is kind of isolated and cut off from everything else. But consciousness is actually the way that our mental lives appear subjectively to us. So how one's mental reality appears and what that mental reality actually is have to be distinct factors. And once we recognize those two independent factors, then we can readily theorize in higher order terms. So in conclusion, a high order theory by distinguishing mental appearance from mental reality offers an accurate and useful explanation of consciousness in contrast with an uninformative first order redescription in cognate terms, which generates a sense of mystery. And positing high order thoughts as the way we're aware of our conscious states enables fruitful explanations of phenomena that would otherwise remain unexplained. So thank you very much.